Yes, 100%. Hello, everybody. So thank you for joining us today at the Headstream Innovation Festival. Hopefully, many of you were able to attend various um, different Headstream Innovation sessions that we've had going on. We've got a lot of things going on today. But we are very particularly excited about this session with you all. Um, something that Headstream really prides itself on is that we really try to put the communities that we care about in the center of all of our programming. That is BIPOC and Indigenous youth of color, youth of color at large, young girls, and LGBTQIA youth. And what does it really look like when we build that into our programming and empower these groups to take charge? And so what we're going to be talking to you today about is Headstream's anti-racist and anti-oppressive values built into our design process of our Youth to Innovator Summer Program 2020. For context, our Youth to Innovator Program was a three-month summer initiative that included 20 youth advisors from across the United States who were paired with one of our Headstream Accelerator innovators, while also being empowered and supported to create their own community projects. Because we believe if we're going to build a sustainable and just economy, we need to empower youth and give them the skills that they need to go accomplish their dreams and build a better world. And so we're going to share with you a bit of how Y2I came to be, and more importantly, how our values were able to be entrenched in this design. We'll have some of our Y2I youth actually speak on their own experiences in the program and how these values came to be manifest, while also going through an activity together where we can all learn about the power of justice and collaboration going hand in hand and inspiring us to build these values in our own innovations, in our own enterprises, and in our own daily lives. And so I'm going to take a moment to share with you all some of Headstream's values, our values around anti-racism, around anti-oppression, and how we really built that into our programming for Y2I. Can everybody see my screen? Put your thumbs up if you can see. Perfect. So speaking a little bit on our anti-racist values, um, at Headstream, we knew that given everything that was happening, we had to not just be, not, not this idea of not racist, but we had to be anti-racist. That Headstream is vehemently against racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and all forms of intersectional violence. And so we knew that this is a part of a greater system and that Headstream is part of that greater system building a new kind of economy we value lived experience as the most powerful source of knowledge, that the people that go through the experience are the ones most justified to speak on such experiences. And so while we build community with each other, we have to be mindful about who are the people that are in our room and how that contributes to a greater system that we are building together. And so many of the, the commitments that we have made as a program, we spent 12 to 14 hours working diligently on how we can do our part on putting these values into our programming. As a team, we go through bi-weekly self-education sessions, constantly pushing our own capacities to learn and be better. We are conducting research with BIPOC and Latinx youth for our second accelerator to ensure that we can source the appropriate innovations to actually be able to have digital spaces be directly helpful for these communities in order to uplift and support their well being. We have ensured that the guest speakers, our partners, the people that we bring into this community, our storytellers. They're not only representative of these communities, but that they carry these values alongside with them and build that into the creations that they bring into Headstream. Marie, I believe that I covered most of them. Is there anything that we're missing? No, that sounds great. Um, yeah, I just wanna emphasize 
um, one of the things you you spoke about, which was our our partnerships and our collaboration through the Y two I program. Um, that was really at the heart of of all of our programming, and we were very intentional about the speakers that we brought in. And um, I, I just want to, for those of you who didn't um, log on in the very beginning, may have just joined us. We have one of our Y two I partners on the line. Her place is in. Um, both Brianna and Michelle are here if you want to give a wave. And they're a great example of an organization that also valued um, these commitments that we were making. And um, we're sure to incorporate um, these in every conversation with our youth. Um, and we had several, several of our youth even tell us that it was so important to them to, to have the experience of, of being in front of some of these partners and that they felt safe, they felt comfortable because um, the partners that we were bringing in looked like them um, and had similar experiences or backgrounds that they had. Um, and that was something that was, was really important to us. Um, I also wanted to share that um, our partners were, were part of bringing in the youth to our community in the first place. If it wasn't for um, several of our community partners reaching out to their organizations and to their networks about, um, about the opportunity to take place in, in Y2Y, um, we wouldn't have such a diverse cohort of young people that, that we ended up having with, with 20 amazing youth from all different parts of the country and with lived different lived experiences um and so we're so proud proud of that um something that was really important to us as we um brought in uh the youth to our community was to we did an application process for them to express their interest and we were so impressed with all of the applications that came into the program we had, I want to say it was almost 100 applications for this very first cohort, and we knew we could only select 20. Um, and we were very intentional about choosing individuals, choos choosing youth um, to be in our cohort um, that had, uh, that valued communi communal knowledge, that had lived experiences versus their extracurricular activities or perhaps their GPA, although all of our youth are, are so impressive and, and have those as well on their, on their resumes or their college applications. Um, but that was something that was just one of the examples of how we, we really lived through those commitments that Mina was sharing. Um, lastly, I wanted to touch upon um, the variety of programming that, that we had within our workshops. Um, so we had opportunities for inclusivity in several different ways. We wanted our youth to feel comfortable um, in any environment that they were in, and we know that everyone learns differently. Um, so one way that we tried to live the inclusivity commitment was to hold cohort calls that were more of an open space for our youth to build community, um, to get to know one another, to share peer feedback with one another. Um, but then we supplemented that with biweekly workshops where they were learning tangible skills that would help them build their projects throughout the summer. And then we supplemented those with curiosity labs, which were workshops that were meant to spark an idea or a curiosity about a topic outside of one of the skills that they were learning to build their projects, such as learning a new language or learning about sustainable food systems or learning how to develop an app. Um, so through the variety of programming and through the variety of ways we interacted with our youth, we wanted to provide a community that was inclusive. Um, Mina, do you want to touch um, on anything else with the, the commitments that we made? Oh, I think we lost Mina. <laughs> um, but I'll just round us out by saying um, that our conception of justice within youth programming was really heavily influenced by the insights of our young people in our cohort. 
So we wanted to continue to listen to them, um, continue to learn from them, um, and, and continue to build with them. Um, and this really was their cohort. Um, I think we just had Nina join us. So I'll transition over to her um, to introduce um, the next portion of our session where we will hear from the young people that we've been talking about today. Yes, my apologies, everybody. Something we learned well and know too well, actually, through our Y2Y programming was that technical difficulties always come at the worst times. So thank you for bearing with us. Um, and thank you, Marie, for giving the background about Y2I. And I'm not sure if you touched on this when I left, but the last thing that I wanted to mention was that our conception of justice, we really were able to understand that concept more by actively listening to the young people in our cohort. When they spoke about their lived experiences, about their understanding, and most importantly, when these youth came together to be authentically open with each other about these ideas and about how their innovations are guided by a sense of justice and, and betterment for humanity, we as a program were listening all the time, taking in these ideas and learning about how can we better do this for all of our future programming iterations. And so with that, since we've talked them up so much, why don't we take a moment to transition and introduce our next Y2I teens. They will be speaking on their own personal reflections about the learning journeys in the program, how, how these values impacted them through Y2I, um, and, and their very own authentic perspectives. And so with that, I will hand it over to our first panelist, Primo. And from there, hopefully, each of the panelists will share out your name, your age, and where you're coming from. Hi everyone, my name is Primo. Um, as I put in the chat earlier, I am broadcasting to you here, I guess, from San Francisco, California. I'm pretty smoky, pretty crazy, um, but we're thriving. Um, and I guess to sort of reflect on my experience um, at Y2Y within the context of what Mina and Marie were saying just now, I feel like for me, um, a very personal impact that it had was being able to see individuals and professionals um, who, like Marie and Mina said, who looked like me, who shared my lived experience. It was really beautiful, I think. Um, I want to go into design in the future. Um, and especially living in California, that tends to be a field that's pretty heavily dominated by a very um, specific archetype of individual um, and it was very beautiful and almost an awakening to not see that individual but to see myself reflected in people working in the field that I wanted to work to and they were professional they were making beautiful creations it was it was an experience and I am really grateful that Headstream was so dedicated to providing opportunities for me to see myself reflected because I feel that representation is one of the most important things that you can have as a young person. And yeah, I think that a lot of my fellow um, Y2I cohort members feel the same way. Definitely, Primo. I'm, I'm just going to bounce off what you were saying there about just the community and how inclusive and safe the Y2I community felt. Um, my name is Harini and I'm 17 years old, a rising college freshman at UC San Diego. And I felt like joining just the entire Y2I program and getting to see both people who looked like me doing such amazing things for the community and people who didn't look like me doing such amazing things for the community was honestly just really beautiful because it was never about like your race or your sexual orientation. It was always just about the creativity and the innovation that you bring to the field. And also being a young person, I think it was really beautiful how you know, normally people don't come up to young people and ask, how do you want to change the world? We're not taken seriously. We're not really 
the forefront of social change, but right like in this program and in the future, I feel like we are. And that's something that Y2I really taught me is how powerful we can be and how one idea can really just change the world. And I thought that was really magical. Would like to go next, Y2I? I guess I can go. Um, I think uh, Y2I was a pretty different experience for me. I definitely, I mean, personally for me, I've grown up being pretty privileged. That's something I've always known. Um, but I think joining this program, I was super blown away by the way that it was set up, um, the lessons that we learned, but it wasn't just about the education or the access to all these super amazing companies and people that were doing such amazing things, but there was this time that we were given to self-reflect, uh, and we had some take-home assignments for our community projects, and our community projects were our ideas, um, and I think that was something that was really important to me to be given kind of the space to think about as a youth, as a woman, like what I wanted to see and what I wanted to do about bringing social change as, um, as a young person. And I think the other thing I was thinking about was that you see all these companies during things like Pride Month or even during events like right now in the Black Lives Matter movement, they make changes to maybe their marketing or their policies in their company to kind of fit the situation that they're in. Um, and you kind of see it for a moment, you know, everything online becomes rainbow or everything is centered around that one event and then suddenly it all disappears. And it almost feels like it doesn't really have an impact. But Y2I and Headstream was the first time when I really saw that it was continuous and there was a really a dedication to making social change and to building those anti-racist values. And it wasn't gonna, I didn't feel like it was going to stop when I left the program or stop like when the program ended. And I think that's something that I definitely wanna to bring to other youth programs and just to every space that I kind of am in from now on. I know exactly what you mean, Lexi by the feeling of everything not going away. Um, my name is Summer Knowles. My pronouns are easier. And when I first, after our first um, Y2I session, I was a little bit worried because I just so happened to get on at a time where I didn't see any other black, um, black members. And I was just so afraid that this is just going to be another experience of tokenism and discomfort for me especially after an activity where it seemed that everyone was aware of the state of the world, but not aware of the emotions behind the things that were going on, and it really hurt. Um, however, I was immediately reassured by David, um, and he was telling me that all of the um, all of the Y2Y community and the Headstream Accelerator creators it would be working to make sure this felt like a safe place for me and it really began to um it really began to just be an unforgettable experience and i did love every one of the empowered black leaders that um led sessions and the mem every member that i got to meet whether they were black or not has become a friend of mine 
Yeah, and then I would like to follow up Summers. Um, my name is Perla Gonzalez. I am 18 years old, she, her, and I'm calling in from the Midwest. And similar to um, Summer, I I was worried a bit because I didn't see a lot of like people from like my background as well. And, and, and it kind of, um, I don't know, it made me scared of like, oh shoot, I joined the team. I made it into the program. Um, what do we do now? So I was kind of freaking out a bit because for where I come from, we are known as the most segregated city of America. So yeah, it was a bit iffy there. We're like, from where I come from, it's quite ironic that racism doesn't discriminate unless you are born with the privilege, then you get a pass. But like what I mean with this is like, racism doesn't care if you're Will Smith making Hollywood movies or if you're like a woman of color mopping floors, it will touch you. And it will touch you in ways you can't even imagine. It can be really painful, really cruel. But like being part of Y2I, that kind of redefined my reality a bit. And we're virtual. So you can imagine the power that it had. In a way, I feel like it raised the bar for me, literally, in like my real life where I'm thinking, damn, I feel like I was, oh, sorry, excuse me. Yeah, but I feel like I was born twice with Y2I, first time when I took my first breath. And then again with Y2I after I met all these wonderful people where we grew together with our projects, we grew together as a community and we're continuing to grow. And like, I don't know if, well, some of you guys were in the last, um, was it presentation workshop where we had a meet and greet where like with Y2Y, it's never a goodbye. It's always, I'll see you later. But yeah. Thanks, y'all. Is there anyone, is there any other Y2I thoughts on, on these values, about the experience, about any aspect that you want to share? I think one aspect of Y2I that I forgot to touch on earlier was just, um, it introduced me to the concept of intersectionality, which I think is really powerful and kind of um, underrepresented in everyday life because at least for me, I'm always like conflicted because in certain environments, I feel like, oh, I'm too, I'm too Indian, I'm too brown, I'm too ethnic. And then in certain environments, I'm like, oh, I'm not ethnic enough. And I just feel like there's always this struggle, like, who are you really? Like, and it's never just like all one thing or all another thing. You're this beautiful, unique mix of everything that defines you. And I think that that is something that's so, so powerful. And every step of the way throughout our Y2Y journey, that was taken into account that every one of us, like whether it be one of the headstream directors or whether it was one of us as youth, we're all our own unique mix of traits. And that gives us this like completely unparalleled perspective, which I thought was like a really beautiful thing to, to mention right now. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, it was definitely enriching listening to all of you during the program. And it's even more profound that all of you in this space right now get to listen to these amazing young people. Um, I think something that Marie and I have, have, have really thought about a lot and have tried to internalize is that, um, Y2I, this was our very first iteration creating something like this. And something that we knew from the get-go was that there actually really isn't a program like this, let alone one that is attached to an accelerator program. This is really the first of its kind. And so it, it was needed. We saw the need and we needed to create that need, which means that we wanna inspire you all 
for your own ventures, for your own programming to do the same. But we know that it was not perfect. We can always be better and we can always do more. But this time, we invite you all to do better with us. And that is why we believe that collaboration and justice, they go hand in hand as we conducted outreach, as we made sure that our cohort diversely represented BIPOC teens, Latinx teens, Asian people of color, the queer community that represents queer, trans, non-binary, uh, gay, bisexual, lesbian youth, we wanted to pack that in. We can still do more. We can still do better. And that is our personal goal. And we invite you all to share this goal with us in your own programming. And so we're going to do an activity together, but before we do so, we know that we shared a lot of content with you and our young people were really vulnerable and authentic and raw with all of you. And so that may bring up questions about your own programs that are specific to the young people that shared today. And so we want to open up this space for anybody who has any questions that you'd want to ask myself, Marie, or any of the Y2I youth here today. I have a question. Um, so this is a strange year. Everything got transitions online. I know from personal experience, all my meetings, all my classes and whatnot. Um, and it sounds like from your experience, you all really developed a relationship, but over the internet, over a screen, but that these people are like family now. Can, can you guys share a little bit about how you went about doing that? Um, what that was like maybe um, barriers, what worked, what didn't work? Yeah, I can start off and then and then pass it over to Mina to also share her experience. Um, I think one of the things that really helped us all form relationships with one another, whether it be Mina and myself with the youth or the youth with each other, um, we wanted to make sure there was enough time and enough space to have genuine, authentic conversations. Um, and so we did consistent touch points. Um, we had weekly calls with our youth and on, the, on one week we would have a workshop and on the opposite week, the complimentary week, we would have a cohort call. So we were always trying to balance the, the content we were sharing with them, the resources, the skill building, the, you know, the important learnings that, that they were all experiencing with the community building and allowing enough space to do that. And even though we didn't originally build it into our program, um, we actually, if this came directly from the youth on this call, they wanted to have a Y2I hangout night on top of all those touch points that we had built in. And so we really love those hangout nights with them. Um, they led them. We did not facilitate them. It was just a genuine opportunity for them to get to know each other better and to, to hear from one another and to, and, and to also for them to get to know Mina and myself as people and not just their, their headstream Y2I program coordinators. Um, so I think time and space is, is the key to, to forming those relationships. Um, we also try to make ourselves available outside of the scheduled touch points. So it wasn't, you can only talk to us on Mondays when we have the workshops. It was we're available for you. And, and that means on Slack, it means over email, it means texting. It means if you need something, we're here for you. For you. Um, 2020, as we all know, has been a very difficult year for many of us. We're going through a pandemic, um, racial injustice in the world, uh, the California's on fire. Um, there's a flash flood in Washington, D.C. right now. <laughs> I mean, just thing after thing is happening. And so for a program that was focused on um, well-being and creating a beautiful internet and beautiful digital spaces for teens, we had to lead with, uh, with well-being. We had to make sure that they were all safe, that they were all comfortable so that they could show up to every conversation as their best selves. And that meant Mina and I providing that kind of extra support along the way and the space and time to do so. 
can I build onto that a little bit, Marie? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that the hangout, in, in terms of like really getting to the root of what I think Brianna was asking, um, in terms of like creating relationships with people when you're not there in person, um, I think that something that I, a way that I approach it is that each of us are, um, we are a sum, we are a collection of lots of little individual experiences and lots of little individual facts. When you are friends with someone, when you have a relationship with someone, you've put in the time and you've spent a lot of time getting to know that person and collecting all of those little facts about them. And I think that through not only the hangout nights, but also curiosity labs that were open for the Y2Y youth to lead, we were able to, even in just two months, get to know all of the little pieces. Um, and even though each of these little moments was just like a small fact, like um, for summer, oh, Z is really good at poetry or Alexa um, surfs, like those little things, um, when you sort of pull back, or at least when I pulled back at the end, um, I realized had become friendships and relationships and really, amazing things. So I think we can't underestimate the little things that we learn about people, even if we're not in the same room. And um, just to build on top of Primo, building on top of Marie, it was also really funny the other day we were in a call uh, preparing for this um, innovation festival. And I realized that I know so many things about my Y2I family, like the experiences that make them who they are. But for a lot of them, like I didn't know where they lived because we're so spread across the country and I didn't know how old they were. But I knew these like key moments in their lives that like shaped them to be the person they are today. And I thought that that was really interesting because normally when you are starting to build a relationship with someone, you just get to know like the basics, but we kind of dove straight in and were put in this environment where you got to know them so well and to the point where things like age and like location were kind of like, it's like we're past that already. I don't know how we didn't know this about each other, which is a really interesting, unique experience. Yeah, it was so funny. Just yesterday, um, I was talking to Harini, and of course, like, we've known each other for a few months now. We know, like, just like she was saying, we, we've known all these, like, deep things. Like, we've talked about our projects and, and well-being, and I was, like, a little awkward asking, like, wait, where do you live? Like, it was just funny. Like, after all these months of knowing each other and having these conversations, we're kind of going back to the start, but yeah. I think just to build off of this whole train, um, I think, Brianna, to answer the other piece of your question is actually a challenge that is in this kind of virtual programming where there is so much that you want to learn about people that like even our weekly calls actually weren't enough for the amount of support that like for young people to fully build out their community projects they need additional touch points and somebody needs to schedule those touch points. And like, we, we need, so, like, we need multiple spaces in a week. And, and that takes a lot of time to, to plan and prep for. And so we did the best with what we can. Um, and I think it, it turned out incredible, but that's how moments like, Oh, Harini, you're going to UCSD. Like I was just hearing about how you're going to be a mental health professional one day and so that's how moments like that happen but also this is when like resources and to truly to 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 make this very holistic that's sometimes the challenge um where you have to really creatively navigate and so i think y2i for like even just a weekly hour and a half meeting the level of relationship that we have is incredible we also had a Slack group that continues to exist today. And through that Slack is how we communicate with all the young people and keep in touch. I have a question. Um, uh, it took me a minute to formulate because I'm just so in awe of all of you. But um, I'm wondering if you all can talk a little bit about what you learned because theoretically you all came together, right? And you're all working on um, how to improve well-being. Um, and I'm wondering if because you all come from different communities and different experiences um, and different identities, 
if you had any kind of learnings about like youth well-being in particular or moments where you were like my understanding of what young people need to be well um was expanded um and if the question doesn't make sense let me that like let me know and i'll reframe I can just, I don't, sorry. No, no, oh, go no, ahead, no, ahead. No, no, you go ahead. It's okay. Are you sure? Yeah, I can go after. Um, I have a very specific answer to this question. Um, one of the youth on this call, Ariel, um, um, her community project was to create sort of this um, texting bot that can help youth help their friends um, who might be struggling with mental illness um or need support in any way um and so i was fortunate enough just by like random stars aligning coincidence to be um in a like i can't remember what we called them but they were like sessions where we could come share out our ideas and get feedback from both mina um marie and other youth um and i was in one of these sessions with ariel and we were talking about how um what mental health support um say ariel might need is very different from the support that i might need just because like you said like our identities are very different and so it was really interesting to think about we can't just say well-being as this like giant overarching category for everything because the needs of um someone living like here in san francisco attending like a big private school here versus the needs of like um, someone attending a public school in Los Angeles are very different um, in terms of the support that their families may or may not give them, the support that they have in their school environment. And that's just like 300 miles away from each other here in California. But then I'm on the West Coast, Ariel is on the East Coast. That's an even greater distance. And so I think in, connect in just connecting with people and getting to know them, through some sort of weird osmosis, you sort of come to, or at least I sort of came to understand how to anticipate and how to care for my peers who come from different um, backgrounds and experiences than me. I wanna pass it to Mia. <laughs> and that was amazing. And now like my, mine is definitely just like a lot more general, but I completely um, agree with Primo. Um, for me, I think just like this past, I mean, I think for everyone, just this past like several months has been very up and down. And for me, I think one thing I felt consistently, especially in the beginning, was feeling a lot of loneliness and kind of this like, I don't know what I'm doing. I feel very detached from the world and um, kind of putting these things hand in hand, like going to these Y2Y meetings and um, like we've all been talking about before this, making these relationships with these people. I mean, like after every call, I would just feel so like connected and I would just want to tell my mom or someone like everything we talked about. And I just felt so like radiant about all the things that we were learning and all these like connections I had made and like comparing that with like the loneliness I had felt. I think something I'd say for important um, for youth well-being is making these connections and having a place or some type of support system that you can have these experiences with someone because um, like after feeling the way I did um, going to these meetings and talking to these people really like had, was a huge difference and I could see myself improving in those areas just throughout the summer. I think if I could add on to that a bit um, but also to Primo's on how we all came from such different backgrounds. The ideas for our community projects were so diverse that I think something I learned about youth well-being is that kind of like it's not that blanket term, but there's so many issues that we still have to solve. And by bringing together all of these diverse backgrounds and opinions and thoughts, I mean, the, the different things that we each came up with to solve our community projects were, I mean, so many. I, one of our youth, Sarai, she was doing a project on 
human trafficking. And I mean, to be completely honest with you, I hadn't even thought about that for, I mean, of course I knew a bit about what it was, but I hadn't thought about it to solve it, to fix it as a problem, how it was related to youth well-being, but she had. Um, and so I think something that I learned was that if you bring together these different people um, and these different stories, that there's so much that you can do, which I think is super amazing. It's beautiful when you see like all these things put together, like all the, di all the different ideas, things you would have never have thought of, but everyone has their own unique passions and things that they're, um, things that they're skilled in. And, and like when you all put it together, it creates this like beautiful, I don't know, like this mosaic of like all of us creating things that we're passionate about. Yes, yes. I love everything that's being shared. Um, I want to share a couple points just as the person who kind of saw everybody from beginning to end in a lot of transitions. There were a couple things about wellness that I learned. Um, and also to touch on to your question, Maheen. Um, so the first was that I think oftentimes when we talk about wellness and mental wellness, we, we, we think about mental health directly. Um, but something that I learned from this phenomenal cohort was that youth well-being is directly tied to their agency to transform the society in which they live in. For youth to be able to take that agency towards social action, towards social change, having a role, and not only having a role, but a leading role, is directly connected to their empowerment and their wellness. And I think that's something that I saw in so many of their projects on how can digital spaces encourage that, foster that, and make that flourish in our physical reality as well as our digital one. And I think a really great example of how I learned about different identities in terms of wellness I actually came from two specific comments and projects. So the first was, I have to give him a shout out for Primo, um, is creating a platform called Style, which is about how fashion is directly connected to wellness for queer, non-binary, and trans youth. And that completely transformed the way that I think about wellness for the LGBTQIA community. And that started to go into our programming about, okay, that's something we really need to be cognizant about. And empowering and watching Primo make his magic come to life. We, our own understanding as a headstream program about like supporting LGBTQ wellness started to transform. Another phenomenal example was Summer Knowles one time gave me a very raw and vulnerable comment saying that when I go on Instagram, and I see videos of really atrocious things happening to Black people in this country, it creates a kind of anxiety that when I go into my Calm app and it asks me to trace back my anxiety, it doesn't, I know the source of my anxiety. I know it and I need an app that is designed for my specific needs. And when Summer shared that, like, it transformed the way that we think about the innovations that we source. And I hope that's something that can also inspire all of you about thinking inclusively and designing collaboratively and thinking from a lens of justice. So thank you, Primo and Summer, for let, letting me shout you both out and your geniusness. Um, and with that, I want us to kind of switch gears a little bit into a Y2I activity we did together that we now want to do with all of you, led by our Y2I youth, in order to really think about this idea of justice and collaboration hand in hand. So with that, Primo, I will hand it to you to set the stage. All right. So. Obviously, in talking about Y to I and learning about Y to I um, in this session and then possibly in other sessions that you all might have attended, um, I'm sure you've heard a lot about this community and these connections that we have made together as young people. Um, and as Mina said, that connection arose out of the agency to act on what we want to, we want to be the change that we want to see in the world. But none of us can do that alone. All of it has been collaborative, both collaboration between us as young people and intergenerational collaboration between Mina and us, between um, other people from Headstream and Second Muse and us. And that collaboration 
and that justice that comes from us fighting for what we want to see in the world are inseparable. Collaboration and justice are inseparable. They go together. And so the activity that we are going to be leading you all in today is sort of a quick and fast and beautifully amazing way to see how, one, collaboration and justice go together, and two, how collaboration can feel like the most amazing thing in the world. Um, and so what we are going to be doing is we are going to be using a poem to guide our understanding of justice and collaboration. We're going to be creating this together. And then from this poem will arise, at least we hope, feelings of liberty, feelings of power, feelings of unity. Because I think we forget that these things that we as people of color, we as queer people are fighting for, liberty, justice, equity, all of these things are inherently joyous states of being. And so we actually participated in a similar activity in Y2I, and we wanted to bring this all to you so you can experience this same joy of unity that we did. And with that, I will pass it to Perla um, to kick us off. Yes. Hello. So like how Prima was saying, we're going to, well, I'm going to read through this poem once. And then what we want you guys to do is to reflect upon what the words in the poem mean to you and kind of like jot down any ideas, any feelings that you may feel while I'm reading the poem. And yeah, you guys are going to have three minutes after I read it to do so. And I will begin. It says, I don't care about the evolution of man or machine, Darwinism or the digital age. There's no use to me if racism hasn't ceased to be. I'm petitioning for a new almighty, a varsity deity that's not too flighty. The flood failed, but it's not too late. If eugenics become viable and reliable, we ought to blot out every taught teen and trend. We ought to erode anyone failing to relinquish their bigotry. We ought to eradicate anyone failing to relinquish the right to rifles when affronted when affronted with someone else's l right to life. You guys have three minutes, like I said, to really reflect on what this means what this means to you and then any thoughts you that you may have about the poem. Okay, so now I'm just going to go through and read the poem again. And this time when listening to it, instead of just reflecting upon it, uh, we thought it would be really powerful if everyone came up with sort of a last line to the poem. And the last line is more of an action item, something that will inspire you to do your part to fight against injustice. So we have the poem here and then you guys can come up with a sort of last line of finale type moment and um, just type it in the chat so that we can, uh, we can read it all together. I don't care about the evolution of man or machine, Darwinism or the digital age. They're no use to me if racism hasn't ceased to be. I'm petitioning for a new almighty, a varsity deity that's not too flighty. The flood failed, 
but it's not too late. If eugenics becomes viable and reliable, we ought to blot out every tot, teen, and trend. We ought to erode anyone failing to relinquish their bigotry. We ought to eradicate anyone failing to relinquish their right to rifles when affronted with someone else's right to life. So now just take a moment and come up with a last line that's more of a, a call to action. How can you help fight injustice and bigotry? And just type it in the chat. I'm gonna do it too. If you haven't already done so, start putting your line into the chat. We have a few minutes till the session ends, so we want to make sure that all the ideas are in. All righty, now we're gonna hand it off to Summer, who's gonna read the poem one last time. I don't care about the evolution of man or machine, Darwinism or the digital age. They're no use to me if racism hasn't ceased to be. I'm petitioning for a new almighty, a varsity deity that's not too flighty. The flood failed, but it's not too late. If eugenics become viable and reliable, we ought to blot out every tot, teen, and trend. We ought to erode anyone failing to relinquish their bigotry. We ought to eradicate anyone failing to relinquish their right to rifles when affronted with someone else's right to life. A modern world is not so if it is an unjust world. 
because modernism is still born when racism still bears its thorns. Justice first and foremost, the rest will follow. Rise, rebuild, and let's all dance into a new space of liberation. Don't eradicate faith in the humanity of all. The flood may have failed, but the future is still a waterfall washing over us, stones polished in peace. For what is material progress without its spiritual counterpart? The time is now, the people are us. To reclaim our dignity is up to us. We can really work to really see each other, not just with our eyes, but with our hearts. Oh, the beauty that will cease to exist if we fail to unite in harmony. And justice holds us all back back from the legend of equality that seems so utopian. I will fight for this legend of an idea, the concept of equality that is so difficult to conjure, the world has yet to experience it. And so we will decide to speak with our hearts and our actions. Our children will ask us at this time, and we will say that used to be. Thank you all for building this amazing poem together. A poem that we did not share its author from the get-go, but this was a poem created by our very own Summer Knowles. In this chat right here, one of our very own Y2I, and together we created an actionable takeaway about our role of injustice that we can all collaborate on together. Thank you all so much for joining this session. We will share this poem with you all in the activity stream. And we hope that you can use this poem as a takeaway in your own lives, in the systems you make up, and in the spaces that you consume. Thank you so much for joining us all today.